a little tip for everyone. Mm. If you guys want to get access to the management as a retail investor, so you're not representing your company, yeah. you know, or huge, a huge organization, you maybe tell them that you are a full-time investor mm. and you say that, you know, you are really interested in looking at this company, you know, or you might have owned the stock. Um, <clears throat> even better that you are a shareholder. Mm. If not, you can say that, you know, you express a huge interest and I would like to meet with the management, like, mm. you know, speak with the CEO or the founder or maybe the CFO. Mm. So more often than not, um, you would get a reply through email and then, you know, you can get started from there. I see. Um, I mean, in any case, there are also hits and misses where I send email and then no one, no one exactly replies. It goes so, into a black hole. <laughs> yeah, it goes into a black hole. Something goes into a junk or a spam folder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www firl.co slash f-r-e-e or www.firl.co slash free hello everyone listening welcome back to the fire podcast best place for long-term stock investors today we have yet another singaporean mm-hmm. what's what's our thing with singaporeans uh? yeah <laughs> you know but you know why we have a lot of singaporeans because uh, now we have mco 3.0 yeah. <laughs> So it's all Zoom. And then and then they have uh, Circuit Breaker 2.0, right? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but very different criteria. Oh, you yes, know, in Singapore, yes. when two people get, get COVID, you know, then they Circuit Breaker. Mm. For us, we have a, to wait a bit, more. a bit more. A bit more. <laughs> much, much more. <laughs> a bit more. But yeah, today we have Mr. Willie King, who is actually the founder of Dividend Titan. Titans mm. or Titan? Titan. 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 Okay. Um, He's also a CFA holder, so oh, no yeah, joke, yeah. no joke, guys. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast, Willie. Hello, hello. Hey, guys. So some background for all our listeners, right? Uh, we, I think we know each other for a couple of years already. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we actually met through, uh, you know, our common friend, Stanley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Who runs uh, Invest with Stanley, uh, Value Invest Asia. And what really caught my eye was uh, that you guys had you guys were similar but different at the same time right correct, correct. you guys the same way of looking at things yet the stocks that you like was uh can be different yeah. i still remember you were the the good old days where you and uh, stanley will i believe debate on <laughs> certain stocks on this channel yeah, yeah. so that's correct. very interesting but i mean just to start off the podcast right maybe you can share with us really um how do you get started from investing right what what was seven year old really already interested in stocks <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, it's a good question to kick off the entire thing. Um, yeah. So I didn't start off at seven years old. Um, <laughs> okay. I started off much, much later. Uh, I think it was only in university where I started investing. Mm. I got interested because one day, you know, I was in a car with my sports coach. Mm. So I was in track and field. Okay. And then he would be always talking about stocks. He would mm. be talking about trading in shares and all that. So it got me really interested. And at a point in time, um, you know, money is starting to be- become an important thing because, you know, to spend on things, to go out, you know, to club and, you know, to, to, to hang out with friends for, for To drinks, the chicks uh. as well, right? <laughs> yeah, <a> club, uh, <laughs> yeah. The club is there. <laughs> so, so, money was something um, important. And I was born in, you know, a middle, middle income family where my mom always emphasized on savings, on being thrifty. Mm. So, stocks naturally came into my mind uh, okay. because... My coach would be always really excited in a car and talk about his trades and all that. So it got me excited. And it just so happened um, when I was in university, mm-hmm. um, my roommate, uh, who is Man Hong, oh, he, ah. he introduced to me a book called The Intelligent Investor. I see. So, you know, it, maybe you can call it coincidence, you can call it luck, but just as I was thinking about stocks, he shared with me that book. So it really unfolded everything Mm -hmm. from then um i got hooked on the concept and the principles of what investing really is because i always thought that investing it's about trading right you just look at um shares as just 
pieces of this electronic paper which my coach has always talked about it mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. then when I read about intelligent investor you know it was on the far side of the other spectrum mm. you know, he I would read about um, stocks being pieces um, pieces of businesses which you invest in so that really got me um, interested it sort of picked my enthusiasm for what investing is so from there then you know it's sort of snowball la, and I sort of got started from there. I see, I yeah. see. So in terms of uh, your style of investing, right? If you read, in, if your first contact with, uh, well, okay, your second contact with uh, investing is intelligent investor, naturally people will start finding undervalued companies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and how were you finding those undervalued companies uh, early on, especially after you just read, finished the book, maybe you were already excited to start. Yeah, so my my starting phase, right? So I started off with a variety of strategies. Um, you can call me a junk investor. La. So I <laughs> dabbled into different kind of strategies. I was picking up different things. Um, back then, you know, people were talking about Benjamin Graham with mm-hmm. his Sigabite mm-hmm. investing. Yeah. So you really go for the deep value um, um, kind of strategy, meaning that buying shares which are worth a dollar, but you're only paying 50 cents for it. Yeah, right, right. And then you have uh, Warren Buffett, you know, paying um, um, fair, fair, fair prices for really great companies, really wonderful companies. You have that as well. Mm. Um, there's also things like arbitrage, um, things like special situations. Yeah. So I tried all this before. Um, the style sort of evolved. So I started off. Um, I remember me and Man Hong, we put in some money and we would use the Benjamin Graham style kind of method where we would scan through the entire um, stocks on the SGX. So that's about 800 over stocks. Okay. And we would screen out all the, what we call the net nets, right? Mm. Which Benjamin Graham had famously um, put in his book. Yeah. And we'll be finding companies which had huge amount of cash and the total amount of cash is worth more than the market cap of these companies, these stocks. Mm. So we were, we were putting some money um, some part of savings and then you know we will scan through and then we will buy all these shares together I see um, only to realize that a lot of these stocks right they are fraudulent as cheap companies so <laughs> as cheap companies are companies which are from China but ah. they were listed in Singapore right and they weren't exactly your huge blue chip companies they okay. were you know like your hundred million dollars market cap companies sometimes okay. even smaller um the biggest we have seen is about five hundred million dollars. What's considered so, micro or, or uh, big in uh, Singapore actually? So for blue chips, you want to be looking at at least a billion, a billion dollars and above. Okay. A billion to five billion dollars and above. That's your blue chip. Okay. Um, small cap in Singapore, a hundred million dollars. Uh, and below. And below. Yeah. I see. So that's 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 considered small cap la. So mid cap is probably about five hundred. Okay. Million. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, so we actually use demo that kind of strategy. Um, I also look into special situations. So looking at things like regulations, uh, risk of uh, regulations being played out, licenses being renewed, um, companies, if let's say if they are undergoing through some form of potential merger and acquisitions. Mm. So I'll actually demo into those kind of strategies. So my style was really all over the place. I see. Um, it was also a time where I was really exploring the, the various kind of, of, of strategies. And I really liked it because it allowed me to apply the knowledge of investing. So applying what fundamental analysis is, mm. how to read certain financial ratios, how to read um, financial reports, uh, reading some legal documents, so and so forth. So it was quite interesting. Um, the win, my win loss ratio wasn't very fantastic. Mm. Like there are some stocks where I was making, you know, double or even triple the kind of returns. Some, you know, I could have lost like 50, 70 over percent. So it was really haphazard and it wasn't consistent. Um, but more importantly, I you know, I had to put in a lot of time on it because it was a lot of reading. It was a lot of kicking the tires. Um, those, I see. Those, those were the kind of strategies. La. So say for example, um, one, one special situation was actually buying into a small cap stock or, or a small company which sells coffee powder, your three in one coffee powder, not in Singapore, but they're one of the largest um, coffee, three one coffee packet sellers in Russia. I see. Wow. So at that point in time, there was a Russian crisis back in 2013. Mm-hmm. And 
the stock fell from 50 cents um, to 40 cents to 30 cents. And at one point, it was down to 20 cents. Okay. So um, that was that was a special situation in that sense where there was a lot of political risk where this particular stock or the company which they were selling. Um, but, you know, I sort of doubled down. I spoke to the management and then um, I sort of wrote through wrote through the the, the the whole cycle movement. So it dropped from 30 cents and then down all the way to 20 cents. And at one point it was 19 cents. Okay. Then after that, it started to pick up to back to 30, 40, 50, 60 and so on. So um, it's a, this is one of the special situation uh, uh, um, styles or investing strategies which I was doing. I see. Then it was quite tiring because I had to put in a, put in a lot of time on it. Okay. Uh, there were a lot of reading. There were... I, I had to also go down to speak to management as well. Okay. So I really had to understand the business inside out. Um, it didn't really work out very well uh, because of time time management issues. Yeah. So I sort of moved on from there. Uh, I evolved more where, because at a, I also wanted to help my mom build her retirement portfolio. I see. And I couldn't be using all these strategies to yeah, help man. her. And I decided that, hey, I need something more stable, more reliable, something mm. more steady. So... I discovered dividend investing mm. where I decided, okay, maybe I just buy a basket of stocks, well diversified, and these stocks pay me dividends. Okay. So this is the style which I've been using. Um, and one thing which I like about it is, you know, it creates consistency. Mm. And it sort, of mo- it sort of motivates me la, in that sense where the dividends come in and then I feel happy. And then it makes me want to continue to invest in this kind of style. I see. So that is the... The, the evolution of my investing style, my strategy along the way. Yeah. Has, it, has it been better for you so far um, when, you've made, when you made that switch? Yeah, I mean, in terms of consistency, it's definitely much better. Of, of course, dividend investing, like what everyone says is boring, right? Um, you know, the, the, the returns you get might not be as sexy or as exciting as buying into penny stocks or small cap stocks. Mm. But what you really get is the consistency of um, building a portfolio and then adding on to the positions over time. Uh-huh. So this is something which is more fulfilling for me. Um, it is more stable. Um, and of course, as um, commitments increase, you know, get married, have kids, yeah. and then you, <laughs> like you have a job as well, nine to five, right? It, it makes it harder to commit to reading reports yeah. the whole day. So Correct. That could happen, uh, you know, if let's say if I were doing full-time investing or, you know, if I had a lot of time to even go down to meet the management, you know, to get on course with them. So yeah. there was really um, the reality side of things, right? Um, time is not, I don't really have that much time, yeah. you know, with these new commitments coming in. So that's why it sort of evolved. La. I see. Um Mm. You've spoken twice and I, I think it's something that uh, we as Malaysian investors also face a problem uh, is access to management. And you you know, in, in the last few minutes, you just mentioned that speaking, you had to speak to management, especially for special situations kind of scenario. In your mm-hmm. experience, how easy or how difficult it is uh, for, don't talk about, you know, if you're, if you're representing an IB or whatever, but as a retail investor, do you think it's difficult to speak to management? Um, it really depends on okay. the company which you are trying to reach out to. I see. Um, management of blue chip companies tends to be easier, but of course, you won't, you won't be faced with the founder or the CEO. Okay. Most of the time, it's their, their, I- their investor relations team, their public relations team. Mm. Um, the smaller companies, so the small cap companies which are usually run by families, um, so far, if... You tell them that, hey, you are a full-time investor or if you're working for a fund, um, there's a high chance where you will actually be able to get access to them. Mm. Uh, retail investors, sometimes it gets a bit hard. So yeah. it really depends on how you um, position yourself. So a good way, so a little tip for everyone, mm. if you guys want to get access to the management as a retail investor, so you're not representing your company yeah. you know, or huge, a huge organization, you maybe tell them that you are a full-time investor mm. and you say that you know you are really interested in looking at this company you know or you might have owned the stock um <coughs> even better that you are a shareholder mm. if not you can say that you know you express a huge interest and i would like to meet with the management like mm. you know speak with the ceo or the founder or maybe the cfo mm. so more often than not um you would get a reply through email and then you know you can get started from there la. i see um 
I mean, in any case, there are also hits and misses where I send email and then no one, no one exactly replies. It goes so, into a black hole. <laughs> yeah, it goes to the black hole. Something goes in the junk or spam folder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. when it comes to, let's say, okay, so now you are able to, you know, create a meeting with the management, the CFO, CEO, whoever, IR. Um, what are your favorite questions to ask them? Yeah. Mm. Um, so I used to be an analyst. Uh, mm-hmm. So I... I, I observed how other farm managers ask questions, how how other analysts ask questions. Mm. The the lazy way is to just pick off the numbers from the financial reports. Mm. And then, you know, you ask them about, hey, you know, about this number, what is your gross profit margin or what is your 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 revenue like for the next year and so on and so forth. But how our, our op- approach it is different. Um mm. A lot of management, they tend to shy away if you tend to be very provocative or if they see you as, you know, trying to be, uh, trying to sort of attack in the meeting, which I yeah. see a lot of farm managers do it. A lot yeah. of managers do it. They come with the intention to really um, um, uh, uh, pick ne- some of the bad points of the rip. So almost like, like a cross-examination by a lawyer. Yes, right. correct. Exactly. So what I will do... Uh, what I've learned over the years is um, just have a conversation with them and talk to them about the things which you wouldn't see in the financial report. So mm. th- talk to them about the business itself. Mm. Uh, if let's say if you are um, you know, facing a founder who runs a property company or, proper, or a property de- development company, rather than asking things which are already on the financial reports or already disclosed on their website, you, know, you can ask them very, very simple things uh, which are not seen like, you know, who are their designers? Who are the architects of this the property companies? How have they worked with? What are the relationships which, which, in which they have worked with the partners? So it sort of goes deep deeper into the insights on who this founder really is, mm. how he actually built his relationship with his vendors, his customers, his suppliers. Yeah. Uh, and that qualitative side of things, you can't really see that in the reports or the financial reports. Right. Most of the time, it's the numbers. That's right. But what really drives the numbers are really the business behind it. Oh, and I think absolutely. That's very, very, very important as well, right? The narrative, the story of it, like who exactly this founder is, what is what is his drive, you know, um, has he sort of slowed down over the years, stuff like this. Um, and that's what I would ask, right? Um, more towards the uh, business side of things. Um, when I started out as a junior analyst, of course, I always make that mistake. You know, I always walk into the meeting room and I will print like huge stacks of financial <laughs> statements and I will flip through as I was going through the management so it makes it as if like i Very was trying to in, yeah. yeah i was trying to interrogate the the the, the management but yeah. of course when you start to interrogate sometimes the information they give they might hold back right but if you start to have a conversation with them you know you make them feel relaxed they are more than happy to actually share more things about what their business is and this all gives you the confidence yeah. um whether this business is worth investing um it also gives you a different insight from everyone else mm. Uh, I'm just curious. Then, so you talk about management. You ask all the questions you need to ask, right? How about some red flags that maybe you've experienced, <laughs> or maybe you actively look out for if there's any? Mm. So one very interesting one was in the recent years, right? Um, there's this company, a small company listed in Singapore. Mm-hmm. Um, they have already. So what happened was they wanted to borrow money. So okay. they wanted to raise this thing called bonds, right? Uh, bonds are really a, like your IOU. Yeah. Um, rather than borrowing money from the bank, you borrow from investors like myself. Yeah. Right? So they came with the intention to raise money. And the CEO was, you know, he was wearing an expensive watch, a <laughs> nice suit, right? Uh, but that's not all, right? Because it's normal for these guys to dress well. Yeah. But he was selling a very, very, uh, uh, he, he was selling an overly optimistic story. I see. So, so how how I know this is, be, before I step into the meeting room, I always check my numbers. Mm. I always check the financial health of the company. Mm. And when I compare what I'm seeing on the on the reports versus what he's saying, um, you know, it has a huge disconnect. So every time when I ask him, right, um, like, who are your suppliers? Who are your vendors? You know, um, how, when, when are you going to collect your receivables? Um, what do you need the money for? He will usually go round all this question, this this my my question, but he wouldn't exactly answer it. I see. Mm. Yeah, and then he will continue to paint how you know how profitable his his business is, the projects, uh, you know, projects in Shanghai, for example, projects in Southeast Asia. So he will keep talking about it. He mm. will always focus on the good points, but the growth he will sort of yeah. So he will 
he will sort of skirt through um, the bad side or mm. the bad side of things. So that's something which you probably can spot um, in a meeting room with a management when you start asking questions. And what happened after that was after a few weeks, they declared default. They defaulted. Wow. Wow. They couldn't pay their existing borrowings, their, their bank loans. So I realized that that meeting itself was a meeting set up so that they hope, hopefully they can borrow money from investors through a bond and then use the money to pay off um, the bank loans or other creditors which they have previously owed to. So I see. that was a lesson learned for me. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, Sounds almost like I a Ponzi, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's Ponzi. It's, yeah. it's bad management. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is just a company where there is a mismanagement of their finances. Mm. 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 Right. So far in your experience, right? Um, Okay, here's a here, here. Let me try to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, if you don't mind, really, right? Sure. Because let's. I I I had the uh, privilege of listing a company before. Okay, and here is the struggle of a public listed company. On one side, you want to be as authentic and as honest as possible to your investors, but at the same time, you are also very wary when you are too honest. In a sense that if you tell everything. Uh, you lose your, you, you're sharing your competitive edge or your competitive secrets. Mm. At the same time, you may lose investor confidence. And that's always a struggle for a public listed company. What's the, I mean, if we were to reverse uh, positions in your shoes, right? Where do you think you draw the line? If you are a, a, a public facing company, where do you think you draw the line in telling the honest and the whole truth versus that of like, you know, there's a, there's a layer that you shouldn't tell. Yeah, <laughs> if you get what uh, I mean? So, okay. Um, let's say, I mean, if I bring you back to an example, yeah. um, if let's say if it's a food company, right? Mm. And if I were the analyst and I'll say, what's your secret recipe yeah. in making this food or making this drink? Okay. Um, of course, I wouldn't be saying the exact formula. Okay. And that's as far as I would go. Okay. And you know, as an analyst, you cannot expect the CEO or the founder to review such things. Yeah. Um, if the trade secret, for example, is the way you do your execution or your marketing mm. then of course you know this this is something which is understandable yeah. um, you know and if if analysts can't exactly catch that then you know maybe just it is just uh, too bad for the analysts mm. uh, yeah so this is something which it it is not something which is immediate mm. uh, you know it's over time when after speaking to management you roughly get a sense on the answers which they give. I you see. know, if, if let's say you talk to, you know, 10, 15 over property developers, um, the answers they give, you know, in terms of, you know, how how they look for projects, how they look for land, um, how they actually sell their 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 their, their, their properties. After mm. a while, you roughly get the kind of answers, you probably expect the kind of answers they give. Mm. Um, you also probably know what sort of answers they, they are able to provide you, some cannot. Then, you know, you get a sense in this case. So you will know after a while, okay, what, whether the answers they give, are they purposely trying to hide something? I see. Or, you know, it's just trade secret. I just cannot tell you. So uh, good point. It's, yeah. good point. it's hard, right? So it has to come with the context in mind. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, in, in a way, you're kind of developing your gut feel whether, you know, over time, lah, your gut feel whether this guy is telling you uh, the truth and to a certain extent that the rest he can't tell you. And then the other guy is like completely just hogwash the whole thing. Lah. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's go back uh, to this final question before we move on to the juicy part <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> um, and that, you know, let's go back to dividend stocks, right? Mm. So apart from obviously them paying good dividends consistently, what are the factors you look at when you're deciding whether or not you want to put money into a dividend stock? Mm. So there are basically four key um, criteria which I look out for. Okay. Uh, so I think of it like, a chair, right? Mm. Where there's four legs. Um, okay. If there's one missing, you know, the chair will probably topple over. So mm. I make sure that the four legs will always be there. So it it is like an, an invisible invisible framework okay. um, for investing okay. in, in dividends. So the first thing I look out for, of course, is the business model. Mm. Um, whether it has a competitive advantage, whether um, this particular company or this business has a competitive moat. Mm. So when they have this moat, right? Um, whatever, how much money they put in, to invest and grow the business, um, they will get a much higher return out of it. So competitive advantage is important. Um, the second one is this, the, the management itself. So talking to the management, 
whether management are dodgy, whether they are shady, whether they're hiding something or whether they are trying to commit fraud mm. or whether we are facing with a management who is honest, mm. um, whether they are in this whole company for the long run. Mm. So this is something which I try to look out for. Um, at the end of the day, all companies are still run by human beings, right? Yes, um, yes. And capable, capable management is important. So I look at management. Right. Um, I also look at whether they are able to pay a growing dividends. Um. So this is actually very important. Um, the misconception with dividend investing is as long as they pay dividends. So people see a high dividend yield or high dividend rate. Precisely. Um, they think it's a good dividend stock, but yeah. it's not true because there might be cases where if you compare, if you look at one company and over the past 10 years, they, they might have been paying dividends, but this dividends, you know, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down or even worse for the past five to 10 years, the dividends keep going down, mm. but you still get a high dividend yield. Mm. So it, it, it sort of sounds out a red flag over there. So mm. what I'll be looking for is whether the dividends are either steady every year or it has been growing. Mm. So that's one thing I'm looking out for. So that's the third one. And of course, the last one is also buying at the right price. Um, that's one important thing. So we can be buying high quality businesses, uh, high quality companies, but if we buy at the wrong price, we will still be losing money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at this four, um, that's how I go about picking dividend stocks for my portfolio. I see. Sorry to interrupt this podcast. I know it's a little bit annoying, but I want to tell you something that I think can be really helpful to you. I can tell you're really interested in the stock market and want to learn more about it so that you actually know what you're doing, especially when today things are getting more complex and complicated. That's why we came up with the Stock Investing Blueprint or SIB. It's our signature e-learning program that teaches you how to pick the right stocks most of the time, buy and sell it at the best possible time and manage your stock portfolio systematically. It currently has more than 10 hours of content and it's growing. You'll also be part of a group of like-minded investors that can help speed up your learning process. To hop on the program, click on the link in the description or go to learn dot viral dot co slash courses slash sib right before we move on to the that one i do have a question that uh it's kind of general sure. before 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 we move on to the juicy part which is every time we talk to stanley and we want to understand about bonds they said go ask willie <laughs> so, so can you you know can you briefly describe to because I I I'm, I remember when you were working for was it DBS uh, mm. that you were sharing me that that was your specialty that was your niche, so maybe you can give us somewhat of a overview a brief day in your life about what it is it the skill sets or the 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 work that you need to put in before you buy into a bond. And then just to add to that also, yeah. because you 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 know you call it, the company you run is dividend titan, right? Yeah. And the reason is because you want something more consistent. Yeah. Well, bonds do give you that consistency as well. So maybe if you can just compare for us, you know, these two different asset classes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So two questions. One from John is the <laughs> day in the life of a uh, bond bond, bond investor. Yeah. Bond, yeah. yeah. Bond bond investor. And MJ is more on. Sorry, the uh, second question comparison. is uh, comparison between dividends and bonds, right? Yeah. Um, right. So I started off as an analyst doing uh, junk bonds. Mm. So I, I, I analyze different bonds. Uh, junk bonds are companies where they, they you are you're looking at companies where they don't really have a very high quality standards. Mm. What this means is that they're actually very high risk. Yeah. Mm. Um, and as a bond analyst, the difference between stocks and bonds, in this case, we are always looking at the worst case scenario. So we mm. are highly pessimistic <laughs> people. When we look at a management, we are thinking, hey, what what what, <laughs> what is wrong with this company? I must find I must find out. What's Where's the minimum? Uh, triple yeah. triple <laughs> triple B or triple C? <laughs> What's the bare so, minimum? Yeah. So a triple C is considered default. Okay. Uh, it's a defaulted bond. Um, As you can so see, you're not bond investors. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> triple B and above, they are considered high quality. So this is this is the this is what we call a, a credit rating, So it's mm, like mm. Uh, it's like a scorecard to yeah. to show what are the, the the good companies and what are the bad companies, what are the chances of these companies defaulting, okay. and. What I do um, back then, you know, it was almost the same as a stock analyst where I would still meet 
management. Okay. Our crunch numbers on my Excel spreadsheet, our read reports, uh, try to understand the industry, I'll talk to analysts, talk to management. So roughly roughly about the same. Mm. Uh, roughly about the same work as a, a research analyst covering stocks. Yeah. But the difference is that um, the companies I look at are very different. So the I companies see. I look at, like I said, you know, they are slightly smaller. They okay. tend to be of higher risk. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and that's why they are actually borrowing money. They mm. are borrowing money because, you know, they cannot get funding from the bank. I see. And as a result, they turn into the bond market where they borrow money from investors, people like yourself, myself. Mm. Um, a lot of them, they tend to have they they tend to have a very sound business model. So okay. the reason why they, they borrow money maybe because they want to expand, but they know that they're confident that upon this expansion, they're able to return the money, they're able to generate a much higher profit. Mm. So when you're looking at this kind of companies, investing in, in these bonds makes sense. I see. But the ones which we want to stay away from, uh, you know, the ones which I shared with you, the, the earlier example where the CEO comes in Nice watch, expensive <laughs> suit, and then paints a good story. But then you see the numbers; you know they are they are they are all over the place. Mm, right, so right. those are the companies which you want to avoid. Um, one another key difference is for bond investors or as a bond analyst, we have to look through a lot of legal documents because mm. bonds. Um, at the end of the day, we still have to run through. Okay, um, what are the set of um, um, Criteria or what itself, what they call a covenant. Yeah, the covenants. That, yeah. Um, yeah, the terms which, which have they, it has been set out such that it fulfills the requirement as a the bond. promises so, uh, of yeah, the so company. The, so the promises and sometimes they might have different covenants. For example, like uh, companies have the ability or have the option to buy back bonds before it matures. I see. Or investors they have an option to sell back the bonds at any time. Okay. They want so these these covenants are being put in place. Um, certain things like they have to meet a certain criteria or a certain financial ratio okay. in order to maintain the life of the bond. Otherwise, they are also considered default. Mm. So we have to look through um, a lot of legal documents. So sometimes this can stretch from about you know, five, six hundred over pages, seven, <laughs> seven hundred over pages. So yeah. this is something which is different from a stock investor or a stock analyst. Yeah. No, but... Yeah. And it's a good point that I, I, I want to raise just just probably one or two more questions with regards to this. You said that most of these guys approach uh, the bond market because they are either, in a way, unbankable, uh, if I were to use that term, right? Un- unbankable. But by then, right, if a credit rating agency comes to you and you're not, you're not an Apple, you're not an IBM, right? And they're likely to give you uh, a, a yield, uh, 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 probably a rating of, you know, uh, very low, uh, B, BBB or BB minus, right? Mm. Isn't that in a way, I'm thinking, you know, in a very simplified manner, isn't that a way if the business is sound, management is good, isn't that a, a very lucrative thing? Because the yields will be much higher, correct me if I'm wrong, at the lower rating, yields will be much higher. Uh, but risk of default obviously is higher as well. Uh. Do you find those kind of good opportunities often? Or is it more the other case, which is like, uh, most of the time, because of this lower rating, smaller companies, they fail to execute and they fail to fulfill the covenants in such a way, maybe. So it's definitely a good opportunity and that's where my learning really comes in because you really have to go deep into the business, the company and really talking to these guys to really find out um, what exactly they are doing and whether they can, at the end of the day, pay back mm. your money. So um, it is definitely l- yeah. lucrative, but a lot of people, they... A lot of investors, which I see who buy bonds, they tend to 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 have the wrong approach or the okay. wrong strategy. They think that okay, if I have this kind of um, uh, higher okay. risk bonds, paying very high coupons or very high yeah. interest rates, uh, maybe I just buy a few, like okay. four to five. But the risk of default is actually much right. higher. So what they don't understand is when you are buying this kind of bonds, what you want is to have a diversified okay. portfolio. Yeah, so a diversified portfolio of this very high high yielding bonds because um, in this portfolio, how how we look at it is really a mathematical okay. approach. We don't we assume that not all of these bonds will fall. Maybe out of ten bonds we should buy or high yield, maybe pay you know eight nine percent. Maybe only two bonds okay. will default. So even if these two bonds default, you will still mm. make money. Because the other bonds paying you eight nine percent, you know, you are still getting a very good coupon rate from there. I see. I see. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Maybe we move on to the juicy part, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, actually, my question was answer yet. Like, oh, yeah, how do you yeah, compare yeah. Oh, yeah. to dividend investing? Correct, right? correct. Which correct. one do you prefer mm. if you have a preference? Yeah. <laughs> of course, if between dividend investing and bond investing, I'll go for dividend investing because um, the key reason is you still have um, capital gains. You will still see share price mm. appreciation. But for the bonds, cap- you are only receiving yeah. a coupon. Capital yeah. gains so, cap already. <laughs> Yeah. Correct. So it, it really depends on your life cycle, your 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 financial right. life so- cycle. Where 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 are you in your life stage? Um, you know, if you know, f- for me, I'm 34 this year. So a large part of my portfolio is still mm. in stocks. But of course, as I age, then you know, I want to see a more consistent mm. cash flow. Um, sometimes putting in bonds would also make I sense see. to me. Okay, great, fantastic. Now. <laughs> we go to the stocks that you're interested in and of course what you're interested in is also what we are interested in oh yeah and what we are interested in is also what the listeners will be interested in <laughs> so you meant we, we are we ho- hopefully if you if there's a time we'll be able to talk about four stocks but we'll definitely be talking about the top three that you uh mm-hmm. just to be sure you own all of these stocks that you're going to talk about correct yeah. okay yep. so um Let's start with the first one, mm. which is Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, it is number one in its field yep. right now. Yep. And so why? what's your case for TSMC? Okay. Um, I like TSMC. Uh, actually, I don't like the industry. Mm. I find the semiconductor industry is very mm. cyclical. It's very capital mm. intensive. Means, you know, companies like Intel, Qualcomm, um, the semiconductor players, Micron, for example, they always have to put in a large amount of money to build factories, to expand their business, um, to conduct R&D, so and so forth. So it's very capital intensive. And because of this capital intensity, Mm. um, it's very hard to generate a good returns on their Mm. investments, especially you're faced with a a very fragmented industry. Um, Semiconductor manufacturing is getting more and more Mm. commoditized and don't forget, um, you know, according to Moore's law, the amount of information which you can squeeze into one small uh, little chip, which is called a transistor, um, gets more and more yeah. over time. It doubles, you know, yep. every year. And what this means is that it's actually much cheaper to buy these chips from some of these huge semiconductor manufacturers. Um, so that's the context of the whole industry. But what I like about Taiwan Semiconductor is that um, it dominates one specific area of semiconductor mm. and they are one of the players where they can make the smallest chips where no one can Correct. compete with them so Taiwan Semiconductor conductor, for example are right now making um, five nanometer yeah. chips so when we talk about nanometer imagine the size of your the length of your hair strand right really really thin if, if, if you pluck out your hair it's really thin so imagine the size of the chip is 10,000 times smaller than the strand of your hair. So that's the kind of size which semi, Tower Semiconductor mm. is making. Um, not a lot of, not many chip players can actually compete with Taiwan Semiconductor on that, on yeah. size alone. And the reason being is Taiwan Semiconductor is a pure play mm. foundry. So they don't, they don't produce other things other than making your... Um, silicon wafers, your transistors. Um, if you compare it to, say, for example, Samsung. Samsung also does um, chip manufacturing. They, ma- they make their own chips in-house. Um, Intel as well. But Intel also sells other products, consumer products to yeah. the market. Samsung also sells their handphone, their television. So a lot of their capital resources is invested in other segments mm. of the business. Whereas for Taiwan Semiconductor, right, they put in all their money focusing on how to make the smallest yeah. chip. So they are very good in doing yeah. one thing. And I like companies which are good in doing one thing because that's when they can really, mm. really excel. And you can see from the numbers, right? Um, their, their, their ROE, their, their return on equity is you know more than uh, 20% every single year yeah. on average. Um, that's something which is yeah. amazing for for a semiconductor company. Um, the Taiwan Semiconductor making five nanometer chip, uh, even seven nanometer chip, um, they take up more than 90% of mm. this market. So they can they can really compete. Um, no one else can really yeah. compete with them. Just so because they don't really, they, they don't have the capital resources 
Uh, they don't have the capital resources um, as big as Taiwan Semiconductors. Um, that's why, you know, even if you put a lot of money today, it's very difficult to catch up with um, mm. TSMC, with, with, with Taiwan Semiconductor. So they, they themselves have already formed a competitive mode or a competitive advantage around them. Um, it's hard for other competitors to come mm. in this way. And don't forget, um, Taiwan Semiconductor, because their chip te- technology is so strong, they also are beginning to sell some of these chips even to their competitors mm. as well. Um, to, to, to Intel, to Samsung. So this is something which is really interesting for me. And that's the main reason why I, I like Taiwan Semiconductor. I, I mean, if you look at the history of how TSMC started and all that, when Maurice Chang actually started this model, a lot of people thought that he was crazy. You know, no one's gonna, no one is going to believe in. What, what do you think uh, are the signs that a retail investor should be looking at uh, when this kind of business model starts? Because you see, right, we, we all know now the prominence and the dominance of TSMC, right? But if you were to take yourself, let's say five, 10 years ago, how, what were the things that as an investor you should be looking at to know that they will actually create this moat, create this kind of success on the uh, 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 runway today actually? So you are saying when Taiwan Semiconductor was more like a startup? Probably or, somewhere, know, well, I wouldn't say startup because there's so much risk involved, but probably <laughs> um, when- Small cap. Uh, Small, uh, small cap, cap and more about the acceptance because you know uh, I, I share the same sentiment with Lee about it being cyclical semiconductor, mm-hmm. but more of the acceptance of this business model. It's like you know when we talk about someone on Netflix, you know streaming. If you talk about streaming twenty years ago, it wouldn't have happened because broadband utilities were not there, infrastructure was not there. But for TSMC, what mm-hmm. did what did the industry needed to have in place to allow an investor to see ah this model can work? You get I me? Mean? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I I come from the perspective of a different okay, right. investor. Good. So what I see is it has to have some form of stability mm. um, in the marketplace. Uh, what do I mean by this is that you still have revenue mm. growth. Your profit mm. is growing. Uh, you're generating free cash flow. Um, but what I'm seeing less and less of is huge capital investments mm. into the business. So I probably wouldn't be seeing um, you know, for TSMC, I would have, I probably would have to start seeing some form of positive free cash flow first before I'm, I mm. get interested. And the reason why is because for me, what I want at the end of the day is two things, right? Mm. Capital gains and yep. dividends. Um, and this yep. two must grow. So if one of them, if, if, if one of them is missing, I would th- think twice about, mis- um, about investing in them. So for TSMC, right? Um, it's, it's hard to establish that they are, they are mature, that they are able to stabilize in the market until I see, okay, they are really generating more mm-hmm. cash flow than what they're actually paying out to grow I the see. business. Um, you know, if we compare to some of these companies today, uh, companies like Netflix, like yeah. what you mentioned, or some of the software as a service companies or some of the technology companies, a lot of them, they are really pulling a lot of money yeah. to grow the business. So they are in the growth stage. Of course, then you you can see how the share price has yeah. performed for some of them. But one thing which is dangerous and one thing which I see is risky is that a lot of them, they might not have formed a competitive mode mm. around themselves. So that's the problem. Um, you know, five years, 10 years from now, you know, who is going to say that another competitor can just put in the same mm-hmm. amount of money and grow as fast and I as see. big as them. So that, that, there isn't that edge. But if you compare to a company where they start to, okay, I'm building up a positive free cash flow. My growth, my earnings growth is stable. My revenue growth is stable. Ah, it means that, you know, they have already established themselves reliably mm, in the marketplace. Mm. And when, they have, when they're able to do that, right, every dollar of profit which they reinvest into, into the business, they're able to generate, generate a much higher Great. return. So a much higher Great. profit. Whereas for companies where, okay, you know, they are still trying to find a place in the market, you know, they are still burning a lot of cash, every dollar which goes into the business, they might not necessarily generate the same dollar or, you know, the same returns of profit compared to Taiwan Semiconductor, for example. So um, when we're looking at companies in the earlier stage, what, what I want to see is that transition in, in, in terms of their, you know, 
revenue, their, their profit, they are, they, are, they are actually making a much more stable profit, you know, it's growing more stably and generating a better free cash flow. Um, their debt, their leverage Reducing. is well controlled. Yeah, it, it is reduced as well. So these are some of the key points, the, the, the key indicators which are- Yeah, it's good because some people get cluttered and muddled into understanding the industry changes yep. and, and and they forget that it's actually really back to basics. I'm, I'm yeah. glad that, yeah. that yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually, what I take away from Willie's answer is really just back to basics. That pivoting moment, yes, you can talk about growth. Yes, you can talk about capturing market share, loss leader, but show me the numbers. Uh, I, I, as you were saying, I was pulling up the numbers on TSMC. Since 2009, uh, free cash flow has grown about ten times, uh. <laughs> so so it's quite it's quite insane, uh, To be honest, uh. I think you mentioned something very interesting that I want to bring up, which is that you seem to think that TSMC is a company where if someone has a lot of money and they start building, uh, you know, whatever uh, TSMC is building, they they can't compete. So I think that's a very interesting point of view because some people might be saying that hey, you know, look, uh, we all know uh, the made in twenty twenty five China dream of. Yeah. You know, self, uh, self reliance, self reliance on the semiconductor tech supply chain and all that, and they're pumping like billions and billions into some of these uh, national champions like SMIC. Yeah, and you know mm. the 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 thing about the Chinese government is that they are very willing to not make a profit. Yeah, like a lot of uh, state owned enterprises are not profitable. Uh, laden with that, so they are very willing to invest big, especially one where there's such a huge national interest, right? So what is your point of view um, to that, right? That, hey, yeah, sure, Taiwan, all that is great. Uh, and Taiwanese people or uh, Taiwan, TSMC is a very focused, but you know, the Chinese can be focused as well. Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes, yep, it's a great question, MJ. Um, so it's about, okay, if you have the backing of the government and if they are throwing, you know, huge amount of cash, I mean, can't they just keep up with yeah. the TSMC? I mean, theoretically you could, but if you see, you know, past few years, SIM, SMIC, are they actually able to come as close to, to, to no. TSMC? So the the smallest chip which they can do, I think they're still on the, they're still stuck in the yeah. 14 nanometer right. mm-hmm. range. So the smaller, the obviously the smaller, the, the better. So it really shows one thing that uh, money doesn't solve all mm. the issues of a company. Um, you know, you still need to have good management, like what I said. So that's one of the criteria when I look. Uh, that's one of the criteria forming my invisible framework mm-hmm. in, in, in investing. Um, how they actually run the business, how they execute the business, um, the intellectual property, how they expand, um, what sort of technology, how much money they're putting into mm. R&D, the talents which they're hiring. So all these little nitty gritty details um, are things which we cannot see in yeah, a right. report. But of course, it's reflective in the numbers. So it's not necess- It doesn't mean that if I throw in a lot of money, right. I can actually build in you know the exact same replica. Of course, you can do it for a lot of startups or a lot of unicorns these mm-hmm. days. So that's the thing which I am afraid of because um, uh, many of these companies, you know, they can grow mm-hmm. really fast, right? They can appear as big as the closest incumbent in you know just 12, yeah. 18 months or in yeah. just a few years. But it also tells me one thing. It tells me that the incumbent or the new entrants in the industry doesn't really have the mode which they, per- they are perceived right. to have. And it's hard to see that the mode exists until they form a certain mm. profit, until they form a certain kind of, of, certain kind yeah. of stability. And that's what I really yeah. want to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. Yeah. I think what I can gather from uh, you know a short time speaking here is that um, you're not a fan of Berkshire Hathaway. La. <laughs> 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 he's uh, growing old and he's growing lame la, from what a lot of people think <laughs> okay, any, any, more, any more questions about this no MC? no I think uh, I think um, you know if we if we start digging more I yeah. think we, we will end up to be a two hour because uh, I really I don't know whether you know but I, I'm a big MJ and I we pretty big I'm pretty big fan of uh, you know the electronics so I'd rather not start digging because yeah I'm not sure about you John but I, I'm also <laughs> I, I, I also bought the idea all three of us are well, actually yeah, shareholders of yeah. TSMC right yeah <laughs> so so I, I rather stop here because if yeah. not then we just go and on and on, and on. that's right it's, <laughs> a, it's a very interesting company and yeah. uh, it's a company that defied the odds uh, that's yeah. all I can say yeah. so far right will yeah. it defy the odds going forward yeah. who knows 
But uh, next, good, next uh, stock that uh, I want to talk about is actually this is the first read that we're going to talk about oh, yeah. in this channel. Yes. So yes. you know. <laughs> well done. Hey, my one of my f- earlier stocks also I started off with a read, uh, but hectare, right. uh, no, uh, hectare read and also axis. Right. But I sold too early, like axis mm. read. So yeah. I'm going to ask something <laughs> that might risk my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ascenda Street is from Singapore, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, t- tell us, right? Uh, obviously, uh, as a Malaysian, unless you travel there a lot, right? You probably have not heard of Ascenda Street. Or even if you travel, you, maybe you don't even know some of the buildings they manage. But yeah. for people like me and some of our listeners who don't even know what it is, um, what is Ascenda Street? Yeah. What do they do? Mm-hmm. So, before I get into that, I think the reason why this is the first time you guys uh, uh, coming across with one read is because reads are aren't very popular these days. <laughs> yeah. Especially uh, very especially bond like it's very, very bond like. like you know? <laughs> yeah, it's very bond like, and you know the the like the whole story or the whole narrative right now is all about technology, yeah, yeah, right, right, that's right. Right. software yeah. as a service. So I guess uh, this is something which it still holds mm. dear to mm-hmm. me. Um, you know, I'm I am a read lover. I I like income. You know, right, I like the right, yeah. cash flow. Um, so coming back to your question, what is Ascenders read? Um, if if you see some of the industrial properties in Singapore, in Woodlands, um, or mm. even in Tuas, right? So you drive down all the way to the south. Um, the the companies where you know they where they have these huge machineries, uh, equipments, all parked in this mm-hmm. huge storage. Those are your industrial mm-hmm. buildings, and those buildings they have, they have a high chance where it's actually owned by yeah. Ascenders Reed. So Ascenders Reed is the biggest industrial uh, reed in it's Singapore. The, I think it's the equivalent of Axis Reed. No? It's, it's yeah. like Axis Reed, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So um, what, what, what properties they own are industrial properties like this where they lease out to engineering mm. companies, for example, you know, where, they, where engineering companies need precision tools, precision equipment, uh, and, and they need space for that. Right. So... Ascenders Reed provide these spaces mm. to them. Um, Ascenders Reed also have mm. logistics, uh, warehouse storage, for example. So things like uh, companies, for example, like mm. Amazon, uh, huge with huge amount of inventories mm. to move, um, they would lease from I Ascenders see. Reed, the logistics facilities. Um, another thing which is much newer these days are your business and science mm. parks. So business and science parks are very much like your Silicon Valley mm. campuses. Um, except they don't really have the full equipments of like, let's say um, 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 a, a place to stay or swimming pools or parks yeah. or whatsoever. But it's an ecosystem within Singapore where you know there's food and there's an, off- an office space to work. And this some of these business and size parks, how it works is um, a lot of them, they, fun- they are all function like normal mm-hmm. offices, you know, very, very standard table, office, chair, uh, office tables, office chairs, and your mm-hmm. computers. Um, there's also another part where this business parks, this science parks offer is um, allowing companies, for example, okay. food companies, to conduct research and huh. development, okay. R&D. Uh, so the, the quieter, like the quieter R&D needs. Uh, say, for example, a food company, you know, fast food company, which wants to do um, um, product design, right? They want to make their burger okay. tastier or they want to know how to make the burger okay. more colorful. So they will conduct all this R&D and they also need space for all this. And they will actually lease these spaces for the Sanders Reed. So these are your businesses, your business and I- science parks. Um, some of the tenants out there, you know, they are like your telecom mm-hmm. companies, your banks, for example, uh, where you need back office ah. operations. Uh, so that's where they house all the quieter technology, right? Um, your servers, your computers, your storage, uh, your, your, your storage systems. Um, and that's what Ascenders really is all about. Um, in recent years, um, of course, they are branching into another category of um, uh, okay. industry, which is your data um. centers. So Ascenders is slowly beginning to look like a data oh. center. Um, of course, they are they they are they are not aggressive like for example compared to a maple tree mm-hmm. industrial, but they are trying to diversify themselves. So buying data centers across the US, uh, okay. UK, in London, in Amsterdam, uh, so and so forth. So this is basically a introduction of what Ascenders is. So how has Ascenders? dealt with the COVID crisis? Because I know a lot of REITs, you know, like 
whether the hotel REITs or the mall REITs and all these REITs are getting smashed, uh, you know, left, right and centre because of COVID, right? So how, how about Ascendas and, you know, maybe in general, industrial or these data centre centre REITs as well? Hmm. Surprisingly, surprisingly, Ascendas REIT is mm. quite resilient um, in terms of their numbers. Um, of course, not all REITs okay. are the same. Um, retail REIT okay. definitely got hit uh, because of the shutdown in the shopping malls in in okay. Singapore um, but for Ascenders Read a lot of the tenants they tend to be more COVID okay. resilient so com- banks for example they still function um, normally telecom companies for example like Singtel Singtel is actually the largest tenant of I Ascenders see. Read they still okay. have to function uh, even during the COVID so these tenants are still their, their, their main bread and butter tenants of Ascenders Read the ones which got hit uh, the smaller tenants um, your SME tenants um, in the food and beverage mm. companies selling food where they need space to store some of their drug products. So those are the ones which are getting affected. But of course, Ascenders has, have, has a very very diversified portfolio of tenants. They have more than 1,800 different okay. tenants. And each tenant contributes less than 5% of their gross I rental see. income. So um, even if some of these food F&B tenants got affected, it wouldn't dent or impact their overall profits or their overall overall rent. So um, during the COVID last year, I would say that Ascenders Reed is quite I quite see. resilient. And on top of that, um, there's actually a mm. trend, right? Like I, I did mention for Singapore REITs is that they are also trying to diversify within themselves. So Ascenders Reed, like I mentioned, they used to have traditional industrial properties, um, your logistics facilities, your business and mm-hmm. science parks, but they're also trying to diversify into I data see. centers. So they, as they transcend or as they evolve into different subsectors within the broader industrial uh, REIT sector, um, it allows them to well better manage or better control the risk. So, you know, if let's say if the logistics sector or the facilities aren't doing very well, they have other sectors, you know, which helps to balance uh, some of the weakness in some of these profits coming from one particular subsector. So that's something which is quite okay. interesting. How, how are the, okay, like um, maybe some context from the question I'm going to ask is in Malaysia, we have industrial, we also have a hospital, very specialized hospital based where uh, private operator of a hospital parks all the assets of a hospital, uh, it's a KPJ. Mm. Uh, but they tend to differ in, okay, it, very small basis points are it's one point, uh, one percent difference in between that of a commercial, industrial, and even uh, yeah between between these reads. How how is it like in Singapore in a sense that in Malaysia we have commercial properties usually paying the highest yield. This is pre COVID, mm. industrial being probably close second, and then the more stable ones like hospitals and 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 uh, being the last, meaning very low yields about four percent. Is it similar in Singapore? Or is it very very different? Hmm. Uh, that's actually a very good point you yeah. raised, John. Um, and what I've seen, you know, things have okay. sort of changed. Um, commercial properties, they in in Singapore. So, commercial properties being um, prime grade yeah. A offices. So those 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 where they exist in your CBD areas, um, you are getting you know you can get yields about four about four okay. five percent. Um, industrial properties have changed mm-hmm. a lot. Uh, used to be, you know, pre-COVID, and if you go further be mm-hmm. before COVID, uh, a few years back, industrial properties or industrial REITs in Singapore used to yield about six. Oh, 7%. oh, it's the reverse. Okay, yeah. okay. So now, but now industrial REITs in Singapore, the yields have dropped significantly. So ascenders REIT, you are you're probably getting like four okay. percent. Um, the other REITs, the under industrial REITs are also probably getting about I 4 see. plus percent. Um, it's hard to get one where it's 5%. Mm. Um, and the primary, the, the primary reason is because, number one, the industrial REITs are, are okay. resilient to okay. COVID. Um, they, are, they are not as seen as very cyclical versus your mm-hmm. retail REITs. Um, so naturally, there's more people buying up these REITs. Um, and secondly, of course, what we are seeing is the trend in these industrial REITs. Many of them, they are moving into your data mm. centers. And as more and more uh, companies and as how the world sees data centers and technology being the next mm-hmm. big thing, 
Um, they also view in this industrial risk, which buy all these data centers as the I next see. big thing. So naturally, more money is all piled on to this industry. That's why the the dividend yield, the yield for industrial risk has dropped I see. over the years. And that's okay. what I'm seeing. Of course, one thing which is very similar um, from what you have asked is the healthcare REITs um, in Singapore. Um, you know, they have very, very small mm. right now. So the one which I see is your Parkway Life REIT, which is yielding about three, three see, plus percent. I see, I yeah. see. Yeah, but it's still, so those are but still much better than, uh, in Malaysia, our risk-free rate right now is about 1.75. What's it like in Singapore? Uh, as it, I mean, comparatively, so that, you know, because people want income, especially the elderly people, right? Yeah. They want at least double risk-free rate, right? Is is that is that double risk-free rate? Three percent. CPF is at two percent right now. Yeah, so CPF um is two and a half, two point six percent. Okay, to be precise. But but if you're talking about risk-free uh, rate uh-huh. in general, uh, that means if let's say if you want to borrow money from the bank, um, what's the interest uh. rate they give you? The base interest rate is probably less than oh, one. Man. It's even less than one percent. <laughs> Much, much Malaysians complain 1.75 yeah. they complain really you know go to Singapore yeah. I think time deposits there are probably what less than one yeah it's zero point I think zero point of course uh, they argue back but sing dollar ma. but sing dollar <laughs> ma, <different>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think this is the longest conversation I've heard about a read you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we talk so little about reads yeah. but it's quite interesting <laughs> no because I when I started my journey I also looked at reads yeah and yeah. I, yeah and mm. that time is the fetish of who pays the highest yield ma. You know, there was a point of yeah. time in Malaysia, I think Q, Quill Capital, if I'm pronouncing it, Q-U-I-L, Quill, yeah. uh, Quill Capital, they were paying about 9.8% yields. Yeah. Wow. In, 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 in yeah, in ringgit terms. terms. So, you know, obviously it got everyone excited. I don't remember how long it lasted, but yeah. So last time yields in for REITs, right? Anything below five was considered lousy. <laughs> I don't know how is it now like I I I'm not followed. They're very happy. The use keep going, keep going up, keep going up. Yeah. They don't realize the 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 share price keeps uh, going down. You know that's why the use keep going. Up. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so yes, I'm getting more dividends. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, uh, bro, no, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, because you know, I think one one thing very interesting about dividends is that people think of it as dividend use at that point of time, correct, but they don't actually correct. match. So like for example, mm. right, you could buy a dividend stock that maybe only gives you two percent. Yeah. But what people don't count, right, is that once they hold it for five years and they compare the dividend they're getting five years later with their purchase price, yeah, the U actually looks very attractive. Yeah. Like I think we have friends uh, who, like, they bought Nestle like twenty years ago. Oh yeah, man. They, they bought it at at, at, at uh, twenty dollars. Yeah, per nineteen share. twenty ringgit per share. And every year they're getting what two three ringgit 3%, yeah. per share in dividends, right? Yeah. So that's like a ten percent you every year, you know, basically yeah. on their investment. Yeah. So that's great. Um, so now we move on from REITs to something that we also don't talk a lot about, mm-hmm. which is insurance. Yeah. And we started at Taiwan. Then we went to Singapore and now we are in uh, in China, right? And Ping An Insurance, that is, a, I, I believe it's the largest top insurance dog, provider I think it's the top in, dog. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard it's a very high tech company as well in yeah. China. So maybe can you just share with us your thoughts on Ping An? Yeah, um, I've always liked the insurance mm. business. So except, a a except buff, Bersh- uh, buff 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean for I mean disclaimer I also okay. own Same. 2% oh, yeah. B wow. yeah. oh, you own yeah. A or B first ah? B first ah, okay. <laughs> B <laughs> la, B <laughs> la. <laughs> A, A you wouldn't okay. be speaking to us already right <laughs> no just kidding I would still be speaking to you <laughs> just not, 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 in the, not in the current house yeah. in a different house <laughs> yeah. yeah different house different house um, yeah so Pingan Pingan Insurance um, so I've, I've I've always liked insurance and I really like mm. their business model um, and the reason being is it's very different from other businesses because if I can compare it to the next closest kind of business, mm. it's a bank, right? So a bank takes in deposits for a small fee. That's why you get your interest rates for okay. in deposits. And then they take this money and then they lend it out yeah. to other people uh, for a yeah. much higher interest rate. So the difference between what they pay you as interest on the deposits uh, versus what they collect from mm-hmm. the loans, they keep. So they keep that difference. So that's called your profit uh, margin, your interest your net yeah. interest margin, right? But for insurance, it's very different. Insurance also mm. take in money, right? When you buy an insurance policy, um, you pay a premium and this insurance collect those money in the yeah. form of premiums. But they don't pay mm. you anything. They only pay you 
you know, if let's say if you buy a life insurance um, upon accident or upon death, then they make the yeah. full payout to you. But otherwise, for many, many years, yeah. they won't pay you that, yeah. that money. And what do they do with that money? They will take that money, um, they will invest mm. it for themselves. So I would say that an insurance company, um, when they use other people's money, they don't have to pay anything. So they really get free money. That There's sense. the float, right? And why I say it, yes. And why I say it's free is because insurance companies, they have, they, they have this thing called a statistics table where they calculate what is the percentage of people under their, 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 their insurance mm-hmm. policy, what is the percentage would actually uh, get into an accident, how many will actually pass away yeah. in certain years, you know, when they will actually, when, when and what's the probability they will have to pay out a full yep. claim to um, the, Is that the actual to So it? Yep. based yep. on this, yeah, so when they get all these numbers out, right, they are able to calculate, okay, when is my payout mm. being made? Uh, when, 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 you know, when I want to make, when are people going to make these claims? And with that, I can price how expensive my policies to be. So I always make sure that I'll mm. always make the money. So in that sense, it's almost, I would say mm. it's free money. And then when, when they calculate all this up, they can take this money, they can invest right. it safely. So I can always, you know, insurance companies, they will buy into very high quality bonds, they'll buy stocks, they'll buy properties, they'll buy uh, different kind of investments, your alternative investments, your commodities, for example. So they also buy a whole bunch I of see. things as well. So just like how um, Warren Buffett does for Berkshire mm. Hathaway. And that's really what, what I like because this business model, as long as you calculate correctly and if you control your risk very well, meaning that if the insurance companies, they don't, um, you know they don't anyhow price their policies they, they they don't set the lowest pricing for their premiums they make sure when they calculate the claims they make sure that they compensate adequately they don't overcompensate mm-hmm. for example um, with that kind of calculations and that kind of risk management um, I think re- insurance companies can be very very profitable over time and Ping An Insurance is one of them um, they are the largest life insurer in China so they serve the entire 1.4 billion mm-hmm. population. Um, they, they sell products like your life insurance, your term insurance, for example, um, your healthcare insurance, so health-related insurance, hospitalization, accident plans, um, so and so forth. So um, this is what I like about um, insurance company. And what I like about Ping An is they are the largest mm. life insurer. Um, and for a, for a country like China, where you are facing an aging population, where you are facing um, a much... Um, a growing middle income group with a much higher purchasing mm-hmm. power. Uh, they themselves, you know, they want to be equipped. They they, they want to be hatched against accidents, against risk. Uh, they would buy insurance. So this is something which I like about Ping An, um, Ping An Insurance. Oh, great. Uh, I have uh, a question on the... Um, do, uh, I, I don't know anything much about Ping An, but do they actually have a reinsurance arm? Mm, um, so... Great question. This this this, this helps to op- open up a yeah. bit more about what the insurance yeah. industry is. So, um, Ping An has a very small reinsurance okay. arm, but it's not the main I part see. of the business. Um, insurance industries basically you can classify into three different mm. categories. Um, the first one is your life insurance, which which is what I yeah. explained earlier. Um, the other two. So the second one is how Warren Buffett or Berkshire operates. So they own what you call a property and casualty company, mm. or PNC. Um, I'm not sure in Malaysia what it's called. In Singapore, it's called general it's insurance. It's the same, general insurance as well. Yeah. Yeah. So general insurance is where uh, the insurer covers not the life of someone, but they cover your cars, uh, your property. If let's say your property yeah. catches fire, or for theft. example. Um, yeah, theft. Um, they also cover your human resource, like your people's insurance for, let's mm. say for companies. They also cover insurance on the human mm. resource side. Um, so this is your general insurance or in the US it's called mm-hmm. PNC. The last one is your reinsurance, like what John has, has mentioned. So when say, for example, a life insurer or a PNC insurer or a general insurer, when they take on a lot of policies, when they sell a lot of policies and they realize that, hey, wow, oh, um, is this yeah. very risky or not? What if suddenly a lot of people want to claim? So um, they will probably say, okay, I need someone to help me to mm. take on this risk. So they want to sell something. They, they might get uh, another insurance company to insure the insurance yeah. companies. So this I call your reinsurers. Yeah. Um, so these reinsurers, they tend to be, you know, if they, 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 
they have to be very very prudent with their mm. risk management because you know if you see the during the, during the global financial crisis uh, AIG yeah. blew up uh, some of the other reinsurance companies yeah. blew up as well uh, because they took on too much excessive risk from these insurance companies so they tend to form a smaller but more niche area of the insurance yeah. industry um, so Pingan doesn't uh, they don't focus too much on that. The the, the key focus is still on the life insurance. I so I you know one of, one of the things that uh, so insurance is to my understanding it's essentially a commodity, mm. right? And it's very difficult to make money in insurance. In fact, if you read Buffett's letters, uh, I I believe like one of his company I can't remember what is it called. Is it national Re- indemnity? Maybe uh, 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 revenues actually fell like 90% over like 20 years, right? Mm. Because it was focused on profitability. And there's always a struggle for insurers, right? Do you lower the standards? Because it's you... underwriting standards, ma? Yeah, the combined yeah. ratio, right? They, yeah. they, they, they want it to be profitable, but then if it's profitable, it means that the customer may not be too happy with Substan- the rates. We call it substandard rates, actually. Correct. Yeah. So the, the customer may not be too happy with the rates because they try to price it higher and so then they leave for another uh, company. So yeah. so from what I understand is that the make or break and how an insurance company elevates itself over its peers is with what it does with the float. Mm. Right? Why Berkshire is Berkshire is because of what Buffett has done to the float. Yeah. Now, from my understanding in the insurance industry is that it is full of uh, regulation, mm. especially when it comes to the type of investments. Like in Malaysia, I think, which I think is a quite silly rule where they some of them have mandates where you can only invest like, what, 30% or 40% of your in, float in, in equities. Equities, yeah. So if the typical stock market goes up, uh, you know, 9% every year and you can only invest 30% of your capital, that means you're only going to generate three to four percent of your of your returns, cap- uh, yeah, yeah, returns on capital, yeah, yeah, and <coughs> and and you better hope you're making money and your your combined <laughs> ratio is good, right? So in the case of Ping An, right, what has been their investment track record like? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, very good question, MG. Um. So, the investment track record that I haven't really looked into the returns or the yield. Uh, are they think, transparent about it but in the first place? Yes, yeah, so you you can actually see the disclosure or the percentage between bonds, stocks, um, properties, and other investments. Um, but what you can do is you can basically calculate the investment income mm. which they get, and then you, right. know, you just yeah, divide prorate it uh. assets which they, they, they yeah. Um, but I didn't do that. I I never go okay. deep into that. But what I did was I tried to look more from the preservation uh. point of view because insurance for insurers, right? Uh, how I look at it is this is. I look at it from a risk management mm. point of view. So a lot of a lot of insurers sometimes they can be too over mm. aggressive. So you know, yes, it is true that if let's say if you don't invest too much into stocks, uh, you know, are you getting a high, you know, are, are you able to get a sustainable right. rate of return? And that's really the issue for a lot of insurers this is because you are it's yeah. actually dropping, you aren't really You can't rely on you. fixing income anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the problem here then is really mm. a balance. But what I would say is that the insurers, I would still tend to the area mm-hmm. of safety because you wouldn't want to get caught up in a situation where the insurers um, overinvest too much themselves <coughs> in stocks, for example, because if one day they have, have to make right. a payout um, and if they can't because of a poor stock market, then you know it could very often default mm. the mm. insurers. So that's how I see. So the investment portfolio is important, but what, what, what I see for the track record of a company like Ping An is like what MJ has mm. pointed out, whether they are conservative in terms of their combined mm. ratio, whether, you know, in a commoditized industry like insurance, whether they are very aggressive in their pricing. Most, a lot of insurers, um, not in Singapore, but in in in, in, in the US, sometimes is very mm. fragmented and how they compete um, with each other is to reduce their mm. premiums. But, if you reduce the your your premiums, you won't be really making a lot of money from you know your underwriting, and then your float won't be as huge. If let's say if you need to make claims, you might not have enough right. money to I make see. your payouts. So, um, a good insurer, they will know when to pull back if the market gets very competitive. Mm. So the whole industry moves in in a cycle. There are there are some certain periods where the industry is very competitive and that's where you want to underwrite less. So it's okay to maybe make um, a slight okay. loss right. from mm. your underwriting, but you stay away from 
a very bad market because if you continue to underwrite in a bad market it means you start to sell policies at a very yeah. cheap price um, you know if let's say one day you're faced with a huge payout or someone claims a huge amount from you yeah. then you're dead so it's better to take that profit up front to take that loss mm. up front first you know you make some loss first but over the long run when you know when the market or the industry comes back to being very profitable where you can price an attractive premium ah, then I you see. come back again so so it moves like a pendulum <laughs> right it swings left and right um, you know in in the insurance industry, they call it hot mm. and cold. So between hot industry right, and cold right. industry. So you want to invest at a time where, um, you know, where you're able to price the premium, premium attractively. See, right. So how I see is this is actually more important than looking at the investments okay. um, yeah. themselves. Which yeah. is a good point because um, I think a couple of months ago, I reread some articles in Fortune and one that caught my eye in, uh, with regards to insurance was actually Swiss Ray. Because uh, world's largest uh, reinsurer, uh, they are trembling in their knees because of global warming, and it comes to the point of um, super category insurance as well super as cat, yeah. yeah super cat as well as this uh, recent uh, statement that you guys made in terms of returns of the portfolio versus underwriting risk. Because uh, as limited experience I have, I, I'm a uh, licensed insurance planner. So I see firsthand the effects of poor underwriting and aggressive underwriting. Oh, uh, no, sorry, conservative underwriting and very uh, uh, poor underwriting in the sense that you can price it competitively, take on the risk now, but then you pay for your sins later. Yeah. If you get what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because it's, yeah. you wouldn't know. Uh, you take substandard risk and then you, you, know, you pay for your sins later. And I want to relate that to actually pricing strategy because, correct me if I'm wrong, Willie, reinsurers actually help the first line insurers price their product better because you are in a way leveraging on them taking on your risk that's why you can aggressively price and with this swiss ray you know and and this super category and this worry about global warming it says oh my god you know that 10 year storm no that 100 year storm that you predicted yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen it happened in 50 years so where do you think mm. Uh, perhaps more related to Ping An. Where do you think Ping An is is at, at the exposure and also the risk of this actually? Hmm. So if our retail investor looking in an yeah. insurer, uh, maybe one, the first line of defense is to see their combined mm. ratio. So combined ratio is basically taking the underwriting profits which they make, you divide it by your operating yeah. expenses. So this combined ratio must always be less than 100%. Mm. Um, which means that they are they are, they are, they are being yeah. profitable. Um, so how how I'll see it is basically it's sorry it is yeah. the other way around. So op- operating expense yeah. divided by yeah, your, yeah, 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 yeah. your yeah. profits, right? And you see for the past past few years, have they always been consistently being priced? Uh, have this ratio been been less than one hundred percent? So if it is, you know, it's a first line of defense telling you that hey, um, this is a rather conservative mm-hmm. insurer. And you know, maybe I will take the next step to actually assess, okay, like what MJ says, look at the investment mm. portfolio and see whether they are being prudent or being aggressive or being active in the investment mm. strategy. So this is one way I will actually see. If Ping An, you know, when I see the combined ratio and then it gets very mm. wild, right? Um, you know, it's more than a hundred percent and then for the past few years they have been doing more than hundred percent, then I want to be more careful. And um I also want to pay attention to the years where they are making more than a hundred percent combined mm. ratio. So it means they are actually incurring more losses this way. Um, and I want to see why. Maybe it just so happened that it's a very competitive market and they are not do they are, they are not being aggressive in their underwriting mm. profit. Maybe mm. that's one. Or it could be that they are, you know, they're just being very careless or they are not very mindful of I the see. execution. So this is something which I want to find I out see. for myself. See. And a combined ratio is one way to actually yeah, because whatever I just asked earlier about, you know, looking at their reinsurance strategy and all that, I don't think insurance companies are very transparent on that because that's their, probably their secret sauce, right? From your experience? Yeah. Hmm. So secret sauce, like exactly to the point, you know, we, <laughs> was, which we got back much, yeah. much earlier, right? It's, it's very hard for them to review uh, how they do mm. their risk management, how they calculate their you know, their yeah. statistics, their mortality yeah. rates, so on and so forth. So um, I, I believe that those are all their proprietary mm. data, which is, which is what separates the good insurers yeah. from the bad ones. The good ones, they will know how to manage their risk. You know, just, just like banks, they know yeah. how to manage their risk um, and they will know when to avoid uh, in a competitive 
uh, in a competitive market and when they can go in and you know really price I themselves. See. Yeah, right. great. Well, we can go on and on with insurance yeah. because it's a very, uh, <laughs> very, very interesting subject. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Multi, it's a multi-angled, uh, oh, very yeah, complicated. Man. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if you know it, then you know you can make good money out of it. Yes. Now, uh, I know our time is coming to an end, but I have to squeeze this one last <laughs> time. And, uh, yeah. and the reason is because <laughs> it's too, very interesting that the it's, Singaporean- It's too hot. Uh, it's too hot actually that you can't It's ignore. very interesting <laughs> that the Singaporean is yeah. actually interested in uh, this company and yeah. that's Top Glove. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who says listed in Singapore also man yeah that's true, la, uh, true la. <laughs> but you know you know we're not surprised anymore do you know that the best and one of the best probably the best analyst in Malaysia on gloves on gloves is a Bulgarian yes yeah, yeah. We, we can we can show you. Uh, wow. We can link the podcast. Is yeah, there. we actually have our yeah we actually have a podcast uh, on him. You can yeah. go check out. His name is uh, Niago. Niago. He's I actually think from Bulgaria. Sort number three or four. Yeah, I I, I I've never. I I think sometimes he probably knows the numbers better than like top gloss CFO. Yeah, uh, exactly. Honestly. He's that good. Just 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 <laughs> to give you an indication how good he is. Uh, the director of a very very famous research company. We can't review who. Yeah. Uh, actually call him up to read compare notes and this is a global research company okay? yeah it's a <laughs> it's a mckinsey type yeah organization McKinsey level, level kind of organization right. uh, yeah yeah so oh. yeah top glove yeah why yeah. <laughs> why okay um so i see top glove as a company in a very commoditized industry so same for like insurance same for yeah. semiconductors um there's really nothing great about okay. glove making uh, the reason why I see is really because mm. of two things. Number one, um, they are sort of the market leader in the whole yeah. global space. So they ex- they they sell gloves to all mm. the different countries, um, not just US, but in Latin America, in the UK, um, even in Asia as well. Um, secondly, also is because of the recent price crash, um, and I saw that there was a disconnect between how they have grown so much, uh, but yet the share prices actually fall yeah. massively. <laughs> From I think uh, earlier last year or was it late seven last year? to so it five I think. <laughs> yeah, so that really caught my eye, and I think the dividend, the dividend right now is yielding about twelve yeah. percent. Yeah, so that's one thing which um, really caught my eye, and in terms of the business, what I would say is I, I sort of have this this idea that okay, these guys you know they are about fourteen percent market share in the whole yeah. global stage. Um, they are also ramping up their 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 capacity. Um, I'm I'm also looking at their return mm-hmm. on capital, um, their ROE. So that's one measure on how I assess the capital efficiency of the business. So like I've mentioned, you know, you put in a dollar, how yeah. much you get it back. And for the past ten years, they they the strange thing is that for a glove maker, they are able to hit um, beyond 10, 10 over percent ROE. for. Mm. For ROE, so mm. that strikes me as something which is mm. interesting. So you know that's how I got interested, and I sort mm. of dug further. Um, and that's how I you know got into mm. top love lah. Um, I, I, I find. Are you sure it's not the dividend yield? <laughs> and the dividend yield, of course, the twelve div- percent. Uh, oh, so 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 twelve percent yeah. is interesting, but um, the worst case scenario, you know, because people would say, hey, really, this is. It could be yeah. just one off, right? Because of COVID, and then um, after this whole thing ends, um, Top Glove will go back to where yeah. they were before. But I sort of gently disagree on that, uh, largely because um, COVID has sort of changed the way people look at That's hygiene right. standards. For example, um, a lot of the developed markets they have an increasing need for gloves, and in in fact, there's also a shortage of gloves um, in certain areas yeah. of the US. So even if Top Glove, you know, they suffer from an import ban, um, I think that's only yeah. temporary. In the long run, the US still have to find a way to actually get the gloves. Um, Top Glove has been a huge seller of gloves to the US since, I think, nine, in, in the late 90s. They, they were around since yeah. 1994. So, you know, the relationship has, which they've built with um, US, I, I think that's something which I feel that it will continue mm-hmm. to maintain in the medium to the long term. So that's something which I like about yeah. Top Glove. And if let's say if they decide to even cut the dividends, say by half, right, it's still a decent 6% dividend yield. And, you know, in terms of risk-free rate, like what I just said, 6% um, compared to other dividend stocks in Singapore is actually relatively more attractive um, than what mm. I'm finding here. So, I mean, like, what, what, what do you think is a reasonable estimate of 
its dividends and hence the yield at, at the current price, right? So you use the example of half and that's more of a hypothetical scenario. Mm. But I mean, putting your, mm. your realistic, you know, putting on your bond, inv- bond analyst hat, right? <laughs> Uh, what do you think is a realistic dividend yield for uh, Top Glove? Going forward, you mean? Yeah, next year, next two years, that's yeah. it. Assuming the price doesn't change. Yeah. Mm. I think it's it's, it's hard mm, to mm, say, mm. right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult to give a number. I, I mean, I don't really have mm. a sure. mm. uh, but, yeah, but, but But what I would say is, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll expect some profits to come down. Maybe their prices, their, their average selling price for each glove might, mm. might actually fall. But... Um, the volume will continue mm. to pick up and I'll probably see, you know, maybe in, <coughs> in a high single digit, maybe. I'm not too sure. So probably wow. about in a high single digit. So that's something which mm. I feel uh, that's, where, more, that's, that's where the more number More optimistic is, uh. and uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of Malaysians are actually. Yeah. This is like a, it's like a junk bond kind of you, but without any debt, right? Yeah. Very little debt. Actually, they're swimming in cash. Yeah, you know? yeah. Top Glove is literally swimming in cash. Actually, they should just start a hedge fund now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. I know you got to go, but yeah. uh, it's just a shame that uh, we cannot continue because, yeah. like, the SMC, there's so much to talk about. Yeah. Even the REITs and Ping. Even the REITs, uh, I was pulling up the numbers while uh, uh, yeah. was answering. Actually, my mistake their yield did not peak at 9.8, it actually peaked at 10.8% for a continuous mm. one, two, three, four, four years. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> for 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 uh, Q Capital uh. so I don't know has has any Singaporean read actually hit ten percent? <laughs> no way, no way. No, man, everyone uh, like I, I some sometimes it's very weird. I imagine right, like half of Singapore is looking at the screen, right, for yeah. looking for reads. Yeah, the need hit ten or Australia, <laughs> by then, <laughs> then the price go up, then the dividend the, the you fall. Really, yeah, read because down, I know yeah. I know Singaporeans really love their reads. Right? Yeah, they really really love their reads. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, I it's a shame we have to to cut it short, yeah. and uh, we definitely have a lot more to talk about. Maybe round two, MJ. Yeah, maybe maybe round two, really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, be, before we sure. end, right? Um, how do we? How do people find you, man? Yeah. Time Give to a shout out your website. And, yeah, and whatever. Yeah, uh, you know, if you like to know, if you like to know more about what I write, so I cover Singapore, Hong Kong, and US mm-hmm. stocks. Um, you can always go to www.dividendtitan.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sign in to my email list is free, where I share um twice a week, um articles with my okay. readers. All right. Yeah. Are you active on any social media, really, besides your website? Uh, okay. Facebook. I think you can. Yeah, you can drop drop in on my Facebook page on okay. Dividend Titan. All right, yep. cool. All right, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Willie. Yeah. And um, thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I love I love yeah. talking about stocks. <laughs> we wanted you to talk about bonds, but it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Stocks next and bonds. Next time. <laughs> next, yeah, time next, next time. Next time. All right. Thank you so much. And guys, uh, for those of you listening, right. uh, I'm pretty sure you've got a lot of value out of this podcast. Again, if you like the podcast, remember to give it a like, subscribe. You know the drill, right? Click on the bell. And, uh, you know, if you have a lot of free time, it's MCO right now. So (laughs) go watch some of our our other podcasts. All right. See you guys in the next episode. Goodbye.